So welcome, let's talk about the story of the Sunkwa Peak. Now I've done two productions on this. This one you're watching right now, which will go over the story. There was a previous video as well, went up just last night, in which I went over all the gameplay for both the normal mode and the CM. So if that's more your wheelhouse, I do recommend you guys check that out, and I'll recommend it at the end of this video too. But on this one, I want to talk about the story we got and what maybe it means. This is a weird fractal in that the story is almost like poetry. It's very disjointed. And we get introduced to a lot of different things. Any number of them could become important in the future. Any number of them could just be about the entertainment of the moment. And I do think there's a lot of personal interpretation coming up here. However, I also see some connections to other areas of the franchise that kind of really excite me. So let's run through. The basics of this are that we're on so-called Sunkwa Peak. It looks nothing like Sunkwa Peak of Guild Wars 1, mostly because it is quite blatantly an island of reality floating in the mists with these massive holes everywhere. But it is supposed to be a mountain that is supposed to be stable and peaceful with these elemental spirits occupying it, but has been flung into disarray because of the arrival of a chaotic, maddened spellcaster who lives at its peak. And so when we arrive, there's this great storm. We walk forwards and a spirit of the mountain visits us. Looks like a deer kind of creature. Speaks with a very childish, light voice. Mispronounces basic words like quell into quill or instead of saying esteemed, says steamed. And this curious creature that looks very noble and grandiose and old but does not act that way whatsoever asks for our help in restoring the natural balance and getting up to this chaotic force on the peak. And so that's what we're going to be doing. As we move through, really interestingly, the fractal is split into separate elemental sections and each element seems to be tied to the spellcaster. For example, when we're in the very windy, stormy area at the start, you hear her crying to you on the wind, asking you to leave and keep away. When you get into the watery section later, you hear her voice in the rushing waves. Now, that's something that you'll only really get as a detail if you look very closely at the dialogue box, which I should have on display the whole way through this video you guys can feel free to look at. Of course, just as human beings playing a video game, we're listening to our speakers and the voices coming out of that. But I think they're doing something a little bit more interesting in terms of where these voices are actually meant to be coming from. And we're in the fiery areas, we're hearing this voice in the fire, the raging fire. It's consistently asking us to leave, to get away and assuring us that we cannot help it. But of course, we have different plans with the noble hero sent on a quest by this noble spirit of the mountain. So after beating the first boss, we pacify this air elemental uh, and it aids us to get to the water area. They do a nice little bit of asset reuse here too. It's not just the jackal mount that takes the form of the spirit of the mountain. The water element is actually represented by a skimmer. A scared and like lonely, afraid one, which we kind of kill enemies in the area, assure the skimmer it's safe to move on. We travel through the mountain and find that a bunch of rocks have actually landed on this greater elemental, this big skimmer. And so the second boss isn't actually fighting an elemental itself, it's freeing it from all of this stuff that's crushing it. I do want to take a pause here because before this fractal came, out many of us were speculating that there could be something to do with the deep sea dragon or greater elder dragon plot here and I'm gonna put all those thoughts on hold clearly this water boss doesn't have much to do with that maybe you can read a little into the idea that this spirit never rebelled it's just trapped while the other ones do go kind of crazy but beyond that I wouldn't read too much into water and I wouldn't think too much about the deep sea dragon for now Particularly because one of the big themes of this fractal is like mind control and possession, as we'll see in a second. And I don't know if they'll do the deep sea dragon as having anything to do with that stuff. Since we already have Mordremoth and Jormag, which are along those lines, uh, it would just seem a bit odd to me. What the second encounter probably does more tangibly reveal is that this spirit is trapped by these rocks. It doesn't look like a deliberate act. It looks like chaos came to this mountain and kind of beget more chaos. It wasn't a deliberate attack on this spirit, it's just been trapped as almost like an accident, which we are now writing the wrong that has been done. And I think that's going to be a big theme as we continue along. As we travel through these sections of the fractal, Dessa gets really involved in the story. Like, super involved. And when I get a bit later in this video, I'll be able to explain maybe why. Because I do think they're hinting a little bit at Dessa here. But what's important to know for now is Dessa's pointing out 
how she feels that there's a heaviness in the area that almost like something is getting into her head that the whole mountain feels a bit off like she's being affected in the same way that this crazy entity at the peak of the mountain might have been affected you kind of get a sense that something sinister is going on purely through the way that Dessa is speaking the third mini boss and final mini boss is the fire boss I really like the way that the elementals are being represented by different things in this fractal. Like, we've seen water elementals and stuff in the past. Now ArenaNet are using more modern representatives, like the skimmer for water, and this time the fire stalker. It's a fun fight visually, but all I really have to say as far as the story's concerned is that during this, we hear the disturbed individual in the fires mutter the line, I couldn't save her, and I can't bring her back. Now that line, I couldn't save her, I can't bring her back, is a big hint as to what's really been going on here. There's a lot of hints in that general ballpark, but this is one of the most explicit ones. With the Firestalker dealt with, we have kind of an intermission sequence within the Fractal, where we are at a graveyard with lots of interactables. It's worth pointing out that as you've played through the whole way, you could often go off the beaten path to grab notes, very similar to what we've seen in a lot of the new Fractals ArenaNet have added. These notes can be kind of acquired out of order. In this video, I'll go, go through what I think is the most reasonable order for you all. But you can even interact with the graveyards here as well. The Mountain Spirit comes to visit you once again, messes up words a little bit more to Dessa's curiosity but essentially the spirit says well, look this disturbed woman is up ahead they're in pain and I want to meet them but they're kind of a bit crazy so can you go calm her down first please don't hurt her the spirit says so even though it's this chaotic force that's done all this damage the spirit doesn't want her hurt we have to go calm her down what does calming her down mean well we get to fight how that's not hurting her as we punch her in the face with our abilities, <laughs> I don't know. But that's the pretense for the final fight. We move up to this precipice at the very peak. And the woman explains she came here to be alone. She's trying to be isolated. She doesn't seem to trust herself in her own abilities. Dessa has a really interesting line here where she says, Isn't that the woman from the picture? Now, I think I've got a lot of good answers and things to say in this video. But this line has me stumped. Maybe I'm just an idiot and there was a picture of a Canthan woman somewhere earlier in the fractals that Dessa had seen. Maybe the idea is that we could interact with some flavor text and it was there and I've missed it. Surely it's not talking about a picture outside of the fractals, right? Like general concept art or something. I honestly don't know what they're talking about here. And maybe you guys can fill me in on the comments. What does Dessa mean? Isn't that the woman from the picture? In any case, the woman reinforces that she can't control herself. She thinks she can improve herself on her own, but we choose to calm her down instead. We go for the fight, and when she hits zero, she says, Cool, thanks. Take what you've earned and go. You're not safe here. No one is. And we have to leave. That's it. That's the whole fractal as far as normal mode is concerned. And the only way to actually get the conclusion to this story and really find out what's going on here is to play the challenge mode. Unlocking the challenge mode requires reading all of the notes around the outside and I think players who are really really paying attention can probably guess as to the story from them. So let's go through these now and this is where it gets kind of interesting to me. So first of all are a series of notes dated according to the Canthan timeline and the Canthan calendar to do with a man who is out with the military away from his wife. I'll read those second. Before those, there are also three other kind of miscellaneous notes, uh, which are very poetic and sweet. First is this cute one here from a little kid. It simply says, Dear Mama, happy birthday. Hope you like your gift. I made it with the fire spell you taught me. Don't worry, Papa helped a little. Next year, I'll make you an even better one. If you teach me the strongest spell, just saying. We are excited to celebrate with you. Love, Lan. So celebrate is misspelled because this is obviously a little girl that doesn't have a good grasp on language. What I really want you guys to pay attention to right now, and we'll know how this connects soon enough, is the don't worry papa line. There is an off-screen father character that's mentioned here, who I presume is appearing in all these other letters, but we don't know for sure. 
It could be that this fractal is really trying to get us to think about that papa. So again, hold them in mind. There's a big thing with this story that we're being asked to invest in this Canton family. And if I'm suggesting that this is about more than just the entertainment fractal of itself, and ask myself, why do we need to know about this family? Well, I can't help but think about Guild Wars 1 characters and Guild Wars 2 characters. Particularly this little girl using the term mama. I don't know, it makes me think of Marjorie. In Heart of Thorns, Marjorie's talking about her mama and stuff. I think when she has a conversation with Belinda in Season 2, she mentions her mama. I like the idea that we're somewhere on that family tree. This could be a good moment for Marjorie, particularly through the next expansion. But really, there's not much in-game that supports it. Another thing I was very preoccupied with for a long time was My Trin. Remember My Trin lost in the mist? Wouldn't it have been cool if it was My Trin at the top of this mountain? Well, we'll see what the answer is. So next we have these two pieces which are extremely evocative, use beautiful language, very compelling, but how they slot into the story is the real question. So first we have this, a poem for mother called The First Day. So we just had a note written by a little girl for her mum on her birthday, but that little girl was so young she didn't really have great mastery of language. Here we have a poem for mother that is really, really well written. I remember the summer flowers that you placed in your hair. The way you danced as we waded through Viridian seas. The joyful smiles of hearts that you touched as we passed through from one adventure to the next. When the days grew shorter and the leaves began to change, you fought fiercely to hold on to the light of the sun, to dance in its warm and loving embrace and inspire others to do the same, seize the day. As the cold settled in, you would draw a flame to warm our hearts and you gathered us, leaving our sorrow and worries behind to sit in the light of our own personal stars, a sea of radiance, but none as bright as you. Then would come your favorite day, winter giving way to spring, and just like flowers in bloom, you'd flourish, with all your colors brightly shining through, an infectious vibrance, a love for life unmatched. Season changed, as years passed by, I watched your light begin to fade, your mortal vessel, worn and weathered, our universal fate, but you held on tight to hope, to dreams of journeys still to come. One last dance around the sun, an epilogue to say goodbye. And so you saw the joy of summer and watched the setting crimson sun, standing with your sand between your toes as waves washed over your drum, a beautiful symphony of soul and nature entwined. You breathed in crisp autumn air and listened to the world go by, sitting among the falling leaves, a sign of what's to come. Yet even in their final days, they held their colour, their vibrant hues, and danced upon the breeze with the worldly grace, unmatched. The chill of winter rolled in, a cold felt deep within your bones, lying down to see the stars abound, the clear night sky, thinking back on years gone by, of joy and pain, of love and loss, wondering what it's like to join the stars in universal harmony. Then it came, your favourite day, winter giving way to spring, resting from a lifetime of adventure, one last dance complete. You close your eyes, listening to the sounds of nature, your favourite song, the song of the world. Okay, so if we just view this in isolation on its own, there are a number of things that strike me here, particularly knowing that we're dealing with Cantha. Mainly, I want to draw your attention to the fact there's a lot of talk here about uh, dying, passing on, and joining the stars. So Cantha is a place that has a great deep reverence for ancestors. They conjure their ancestor spirits. They feel a connection and communi communion to them for many, many years. I think this fract will actually play with that a lot. But in particular as well, there's this idea of the Celestials. To ascend in Cantha in Guild Wars 1 meant to become closer to the stars. And as you ascend, you hear about these great heroes and ancestors around Cantha that seem to have like joined the stars in a way. For example, there's the story of Kamu who was this great and powerful empress at some point, maybe predating even the Dragon Empire as we know it, since they don't actually have empresses. And, uh, you know, she defended her village from the Naga, and in death she seems to have ascended into this celestial dragon, okay? So there's this idea of ascension and joining the stars, and I think this poem's kind of nodding to that. Similarly to how in season 4, they had all those kind of weird nods and allusions towards ascension with Aureen's death before rebirth 
rebirth and then ultimate path towards becoming an elder dragon. One nice thing to note here is in Cantha they have their own calendar and their own names for all of the months of the year. And here we're talking about a woman who passes away in winter and there's this idea of this rebirth in spring waiting for her. Well, the name for December in the Canthan calendar is Kaineng Ta. That's not random. Kaineng Ta is kind of the title or name for the Canthan Emperor, the original one. And now they're kind of just referred to as Ascendant Emperors. So I don't know, it all feels just very ascension -y to me and that's really what I was thinking as I was reading through this. The idea that this woman who's being written about in this poem will have a life of some sort, of some description, beyond her death in in the afterlife. And if you think about it, we're kind of in the mist, we're kind of in the fractals here. This may end up being related to the characters we're witnessing in the story right now. It's also just very beautifully written. So that previous poem was called uh, For Mother. Your going theory right now could be that the little girl that wrote that other message grew up and one day she ended up writing this about her mum. Well, there's another poem here called August in Beauty in her memory. The subject once again is a woman, presumably the same one. The author this time less certain. So let's listen. If I were to condense her life into a moment, a floating speck suspended in the gallery of time, where would I find her? Would she still be the frame of a child playing barefoot in a shallow creek, tossing the contents of cupped hands airborne? Does she live in bits of dry grass and plucked hydrangea floating overhead, waiting to be pulled inward in the soft gasp of summer? Or maybe she is the exhale of autumn, echoing in brisk leaves that scamper across a dirt path. Is she caught in an updraft of warm reds and browns, burnt with just a tinge of orange? Does she waft over muddied footprints, as if she's extinguishing a flame so fragile, you might wonder if it's there? Maybe. Yet, I do not recognize her in the freezing lungs of winter. Not in the indifferent way it holds its chilled breath far longer than it should. To me, she doesn't look like the icy lake or the snow dancing over chilled sand that piles like white ash beneath a fading pyre. I refuse to see her in the silhouette of life frozen against the nothingness of night. No, she isn't that. Instead, I believe she may be the first inhales of spring, gifting existence in its blossoms, tiny, imperceptible, blooming like small rays of the divine. I feel her in the petals of every lilac born sacred in the dawn. Here I find comfort watching her resurrected in each moment as perfect being, perfect in the way that the final breath of summer is sometimes all we have to last us until spring. Beautiful once again, these themes of the year going through, our communion with nature. If you remember in the last uh, poem, we were kind of this song of the world and how we're all connected to it. I think that's all very appropriate where in this fractal, we actually have this maddened lady who is so in tune and in commune with nature that her madness becomes the madness of the mountain. And so in this poem, we kind of see another side of that connection between someone's life with the nature around them and how nature might reclaim and utilize our bodies as we move on. So what's really important is you might have thought that the subject of this poem was the same as the the mother from the previous one but actually here instead of hearing about someone growing old and ending their life in their seniority all we hear is about the still frame of a child playing barefoot in a shallow creek so is it possible that this time the poem is about the little girl who wrote the note before the implication then being that this little girl never got further than being a young woman. And perhaps the poem was written now by the mother, or the father even. Speaking of which, let's get into his stuff. I know we're holding a lot of stuff in our mind right now, but that's the thing. This fractal is kind of disjointed, disjointed and it almost resists interpretation to a certain extent. I think that's the artistry of it. So here, let's uh, now read a series of notes that follow a guy's life. Now, these are very well dated and very specific. The name of each note is the exact time. So here we are in the 30th of Nongkam, 
1637 CC. Now, what does all of that mean for those of you guys out of the loop? CC means the Canthan Calendar. Well, you're more familiar with the Mavellian calendar, which dates the year zero as the exodus of the gods. So for most of the story you've dealt with so far in the game, we've been in the 1300s. It's the year 1333 after the exodus right now. That's the year of all the events that you know. And now you're looking at the Canthan calendar, which actually is at 600 here. Does that mean that this is the future? No, it's because the Canthan calendar started counting time from earlier than the exodus of the gods. Why? Because Cantha was an established nation with lots of history and events way before even all that stuff happened with the gods in Or far to the north. So what is 1637 CC? This is actually 50 years after Guild Wars 1. We're in the gap between the first game and the second game. And you remember the developers actually talked about behind the scenes when this fractal is set. They said it was around this period of time. This is about when the Ministry of Purity is purging out all the undesirables and non-humans that they didn't like. And you got to see a little bit of the early days of this if you played the Winds of Change campaign in Guild Wars 1. So we're 50 years after the initial game, late enough that the original hero is not around and so on, and we're seeing what's happening politically in this area of the world. Also, because of the off-screen dev comment, we also know that that is supposedly when this fractal is taking place. This kind of reinterpreted, you know, almost like, I, I sort of feel like the, the fractal itself is poetry in a certain extent. It's obviously not an exact replication of what actually happened. Just the environment itself reveals that to you. But that's when we're dealing with, 50 years after Guild Wars 1. And non-cam, what is that? Well, that is just the Canthan equivalent of March. So we're pretty early in the year here. We're in spring and I think really we're going to see these notes go over the year, similar to how those poems kind of described the idea of a year. I get the sense that this was a very transformative period in, in all of these characters' lives because of some event that occurred. So the earliest note in the timeline says, it's a rushed note. The writing looks messy as if written in a hurry. And it says, my love... I promised I would send a letter each time the messenger came by our camp and, well, fate decided that one day was too long to be apart. I'm scrambling to write this before- What am I doing? I can't waste this time just telling you why I'm- I love you. I, you and Lan are my world. Written by B. So, just to clear this up for everyone, B is the father. We don't really know what the B stands for. We don't have his full name. And then there's two women he really cares about. One is his wife, the other is his daughter. I and Lan, this is. A little later in the year, the 8th of Saita, a short note that looks as though it was written quickly. It says, I, you'd be proud of me. I'm writing this ahead of time. We've been stationed in the harbour to the east of the monastery and will be here for some time, I think. I've been playing the bipper you gave me as much as I can. I'm getting better, though the others do not seem to like hearing the learning process. So I play louder. Maybe they'll kick me out and I can come back home to you. B. So the bipper is kind of an, an East Asian instrument as far as I know. I'm pretty ignorant on this stuff. I think it's like pear shaped. I browsed over the regular wiki page on it for a second. He's mentioning a monastery here and a harbour. Well, it's really likely that he's talking about Xingji, Xingji Island. That's the harbour there and that's the, the monastery. So this family lives on Xingji, we can see. They are not of the city of the mainland. But this man has been away, perhaps over there for a while and has only just managed to get back. A delicate letter. It appears to have been carefully folded and transported to its reader. I, we're still waiting for further orders here in the harbour. The captain has us training by sparring with a partner two against two. I'm proud to say that I'm undefeated, but only because of my partner being the largest and strongest woman I have ever seen. I, she's massive. Her biceps are as big as my chest. We call her Boulder. She never moves. You should tell Lan. But make me seem more heroic. I am undefeated, Bo the Undying, Master of the Stave. Oh, and don't worry, I'm still playing that bipper. There's a white blossom tree here that overlooks the harbour, away from the camp. It's a quiet, incredible view at night. When I come home, I'll take you and Lan and we'll sit and watch the moon glow over the harbour. And I'll play you a song. I miss you so much, B. So we kind of get his name here, I guess. It's Bo. I can't help but feel the imagery he speaks of at the bottom here is very reminiscent of the Fractor itself. Uh, but let's talk about this woman that he's met. So I think in an upcoming letter we're going to hear that this woman 
like says she has a grandmother in Canther or whatever. We'll see in a moment. But what I'm wondering here is if this is a bit of a hint about the expansion and a bit of a hint maybe about the future of Canther. So 50 years after Guild Wars 1, the Norn have been introduced to the human populations up above. And they may have even been before that. We just don't have any much lore written about it. Is it possible that some Norn went south, perhaps on some big, bold adventure, and found themselves in Cantha? Cantha is actually a region that in Guild Wars 1 is surrounded by a lot of big, snowy mountains, and you can't really visit many of them. You can't travel to many. I've been wondering a lot about how ArenaNet will make Cantha an interesting location to visit for the Norn and the Asura. I think that they've got good ties for the humans and the Silvari. But what about these other races? Well, the idea that there's just Norn living there, like a, a situation like the Omicron that we saw in Season 4, where some Flame Legion char had moved way down south into Alona. I think a similar story where it turns out Norn had been living in close proximity to the Canthans would really benefit the expansion. Because I think it would give us another little angle into the human xenophobia and how the Norn survive and isolate themselves. I mean, the, the Norn are badasses. If they want to stay there, the humans are going to struggle to kick them out. So I like the idea of there being a community down there. And I like the idea that maybe this fractal is actually hinting at it. Once the expansion comes out, we can be introduced to them in a more in-depth way. And that's something cool for us Norn player characters to be surrounded by and immerse ourselves in. A lengthy letter crafted with care for its recipient. To my beautiful girls, yes, both of you, read this one together. Remember that big, strong, scary woman I told you about, Boulder? Turns out she's actually a gentle giant. I was practicing my music, I'm getting really into this thing, out by the tree when suddenly she came over and sat next to me. She said the music reminded her of her grandmother who used to play for her every night on their chicken farm. She has a chicken farm. Oh, and her name is Hayo Son. I should probably tell you I invited her over for dinner when we return, so look forward to that. Speaking of which, I heard that if we haven't received orders within the next four days, we'll be returning from duty. It's just a second-hand rumour, but I might get to see you both very soon, and I'll be bringing Hayo Son with me. Chickens from Bo. So, yes, we get this, like, hint that she's got a grandmother, but, I mean, that could be a Norn grandmother from somewhere far away. We know that the Norn like to play music with their great moots and whatnot. That's my going theory there. A little bit later in the year, a tattered letter. It seems to have gotten torn up in travel. I, we've received our orders from Emperor Yusoku. We're to meet up with the Ministry on the mainland and join the fight in the forest. I know you might be worried, but know that this is what I've trained for for the last few months. We're uniting our land. We're bringing peace. I'm sorry I don't have time to write more. We, get, we were given short notice and the last minute messenger leaves soon. I'm giving him some coin to bring you both a bag of persimmons from the monastery. If he doesn't have the coin or the bag, kick him from me. I'm kidding. Maybe. I love you. B. So, disaster strikes as the conscripted man is told now to move on uh, and join a fight in a forest. So we are talking about Cantha. I think it's easy to assume this means the Akavad forest. It obviously doesn't mean for sure, but the idea that the Canthans are uniting to really deal with these vassal states now and bring peace, you know, against these damn Kurziks uh, would be really in line with the law as we know it. Does this mean they attack the Kurziks before the Luxans? Have the Luxans already been dealt with? Well, we kind of just don't get these details here. The forest is mentioned again in the next note, this time we're at Nemnai. I, we made it. I'm so excited to have finally stepped foot on these shores. After a short trek up the coast, we met with the mainland forces. They are awe-inspiring, I. The quality of their armor, wow, and the royal guard. I had heard a few things from the other soldiers, but to see them in person, I was barely able to stand straight and attentive. Someone called them the Seven Canthan Spears. Apparently, they are Yusoko's best men and women. I'm glad they're on our side. Oh, oh, the stories are true, I. The forest is beautiful. I don't want to spoil the surprise. I wish you were here to see it. I'm going to take you and Lan on a trip as soon as I'm home. Tell Lan I'm bringing her back one of those spears. Just kidding. Maybe not? B. So, what's running through my mind here is maybe they're actually going to do the whole next expansion elite specialization spears on mainland thing. The idea of this elite guard, the seven Canton spears, this is kind of new to me. And as for the forest, you'll notice they're really careful here with their describing of it. 
He doesn't describe that it's stone, and he doesn't describe that it's, like, lovely and naturey. So, who knows what the state of the Echo Vowed was here, 50 years after Guild Wars 1. Uh, he just says that it's really beautiful, and he just calls it a forest. Not the forest of stone, or anything like that. Hell, it might not even be Echo Vowed at all, but I'm pretty sure it will be. I like this note as well, just because it, it sort of suggests a long time at sea, and again, makes the, the world feel big and authentic and expansive. The penultimate message from him reads... A small note. It looks handwritten and is addressed to someone in particular. I read this one alone. I'm not sure I can be here. I didn't know. What they're asking of us is, it's cruelty. I, anyone who disobeys, anyone who shows sign of the affliction, anyone not human. They tell us that we're purging a sickness from the empire, that we're securing our home for generations of peace, that we're bringing order to a lawless land. This isn't peace. This isn't order. It's murder, I. I'm not a murderer. I can't do this. Hyosan and I are planning to leave. We think we can break away from the main force during the raid and make it to the coastline. If we follow the coast north, Hyosan says there's a small fishing village her grandmother took her to when she was young. She thinks we can find safe passage there, away back home. I suspect this will be the last letter you receive for a while. Stay strong. See you soon. So again, a bit more about Hyosan's history, but again, I'm getting the idea that some Norn around Eye of the North time come down, they create a new generation of Norn children there in Cantha, who adopt Cantha names to blend in and stuff, they kind of ingratiate themselves in the culture, and then you've got someone like Hyosan, right? I think that, that could work. But yeah, so we do hear a little bit of the activities of the Ministry of Purity, going on crusades essentially throughout the Echo Vowed Forest or wherever. I love this justification of the affliction. You know, they can just eliminate anyone they want on suspicion that they might ha be holding the affliction. You've got to think about how this landscape politically would change coming out of such a crazy plague like they had, like after the zombie apocalypse. How careful would people would be about that and how easily you can use that as ammunition to eliminate people. And of course, that anyone not human stuff. This is all largely winds of change stuff. But we see it many years as it goes on. Uh, and so finally, the last message, we're in the first of Shanghai of the next year. So again, we kind of go through a whole year, and while those poems kind of talk about everything changing after winter, and really put a lot of emphasis on that, here we have, right at the start of January, a personal note that looks to have been handwritten with painstaking care. My love, do you remember when we first met? You were painting the view of Panjiang in bloom. I waited and watched you work your magic on the canvas. It must have been hours. I was entranced. When I finally worked up the courage to call out to you, you jumped so hard that a streak of blue whipped right across all your hard work. You were so mad. Your soul so beautiful. Did you know I was going to propose before you did? I was going to take you back to that spot, the same place on the peninsula. I had it all planned, and then you dashed all my expectations. I really should have known. You've always been the one to challenge me in taking leaps. You have such a fire in you. And then, seven years later, you gave me the greatest gift of all. A daughter. Lan. My favourite little bug. Lan, you are so amazing. So intelligent. Witty and funny and cute. And a brat. Even if you hate being called out on it. You're already growing up to be such an incredible person. You can be whoever you want to be. You have your Mars same fiery soul. Don't let that fire burn out. Either of you. Don't let the world dim your light. Find your passion and follow it. I don't want either of you to worry. Hyosan is a good woman. Trust her. She took care of me. You all take care of each other. You gave me a life worth living. You brought me so much joy, so much love, so many happy memories. You are my heart. You will always be my world. I love you. Bo. So that's the end of the story of Bo. His fate indetermined. I I'm guessing some crisis struck here. And he wasn't going to be returning home. But he does manage to send Hyosan back. So here's the deal, and hopefully you guys have latched onto this at this point. We have three characters, a mother and a daughter, the husband. The husband is likely lost in battle, maybe imprisoned or whatever, uh, which causes the woman a great amount of grief. And what we're looking at in the fractal is her in her grief lashing out at the world. The question is, 
where's the daughter? I guess to a certain extent as well. Where is Hayo's son, this p potential like Norn kind of character? I think the line about fire inside her is really kind of instructive. You remember in the little girl's note, she talked about the mother being good with elemental magic as well. So that's probably a nice little hint. And I want to draw your, your guys' attention to that line as well about light and never letting the world dim their light because I think that's big. Around now, you probably have all the achievements available and you'll be able to play the challenge mode, which reveals uh, in much more precise terms who the characters are. But before I take you guys there, there are some graves as well. Now, these are amazing in a weird way. Either the devs made a mistake or they are really, really making this fractal hard to understand. And it takes us back to this idea of ancestor worship. So here's the first monument. It says this stone stands covered in a gentle coat of moss. It's elegant, conveying a sense of wisdom and serenity. We can choose to wipe the moss away. In which it says there looks to be something written beneath the moss. We read the inscription. It says CMD. Now is that a generic thing that appears on graves? Or, or, or is that something specific to this that I'm, I'm misunderstanding? But it says August beauty, gentle night. Droplets pool in quiet light. Fire dying, cool as skin. Ashes scatter in the wind. Is it air or is it breath? Earth inhales life from death. Newborn blossoms rise at dawn. Beauty's past, but never gone. So through process of elimination, we know that this isn't Bo's grave. He's going to be one of the other ones. So the question is, whose does this grave belong to? Is it the woman that had been had all those letters written to her? She was referred to as a bit of an artist, right? So maybe she had a way of words, but... You don't write your own words on your own tombstone, do you? And something else that's hard to interpret is, hold on, if this fractal is set right after this man is sent away and the wife goes mad, say, on, on the peak, then the graves have to have been from people before, don't they? We'll come back to this in a second. The next grave, this one's Lee Bowes, and I'm going to gloss over something kind of big. Maybe you'll catch it. This formidable stone stands tall, commanding respect and reverence from all who pass. Take a, a closer glance at the stone. Some sort of inscription is etched on its exterior. Lee Bo, 586 of the Canton calendar to 618 of the Canton calendar. Brave husband, father, and soldier. Uh, leaves must change and rivers rise like spring is born as winter dies. We drift through time's most steady flow, knowing soon we too must go again lots more themes of you know life being this fleeting thing and we'll, we'll pass on we all have the same fate if you remember one of those other poems talked about everyone sharing the same fate by the way these themes closely tie to that discussion on the nature of mortality between the two dragons in the trailer for end of dragons i'm sure that's not a coincidence finally is a third grave and you want to pay attention to the dates here but also not too closely because i'll come back to them in a second this stone appears to be noticeably smaller than the others, yet it exudes a sense of beauty and calm. Now, don't forget that we're in a fractal filled with chaos, but this grave exudes calm. Kneel to get a closer look at the stone. Some words are inscribed on the surface. Li Lan, 608 CC to 620 CC. Beloved daughter, continue reading. Though life is short, love does not cease. May she find rest and lasting peace. I love the idea that actually all these graves were inscribed by uh, Hayo San, this supposed Norn character. I really like that idea. Because, you know, the Norn are all about legacy and heroes of the past and remembering people's legends. And that fits so perfectly with the Canthans and their ancestor worship and stuff. So it's just too good, guys. I'm really into the Norn idea. So here's the, the tragedy. Here it is. 608 to 620. 12 years. 12-year-old 12 girl is killed and so now you have all the pieces of the puzzle the idea being that this man is sent away this woman this wife in her grief perhaps causes the death of her daughter if you remember all the uh lines as we were going th through the fractal about oh it was an accident i couldn't help her and so on and with the daughter killed, she's racked by her guilt and grief. She comes to Sunqua Peak in isolation and kind of tears the place apart with her elemental powers. And that is the emotion of the story. And that is the fractal in general. And if, well, when reading all of this material, that is the conclusion you came to, well, you'd be very happy because when you get into the challenge mode, they give you some definitive answers. 
So it opens up with a harbinger that skips you through the whole fractal. The harbinger himself is just as ominous and badass and creepy in level 100 as he ever is. And the astral beings that we found in the in the fractals are their own story, I suppose. But he, he calls you like the hero that can save the day. Teleports you up. And what essentially happens here is the story continues off from when the main story ended. We were just sort of hand waved and told to shove off before. Well, now we're still standing with the lady... And I guess we didn't leave is the idea. She starts going mad again. Lots of really beautiful animations and visuals all over the place here. But you start to see that she is being haunted by bad spirits, so to speak. Actual manifestations of her emotional state. And these feature a lot in the fights. If you watch my gameplay video, you'll know all about that. So I do want to take a pause here because we've seen something like this before, haven't we? In this new fight, which now have these creepy spirits chasing after her and us. Well, this is a lot like the Bastion of the Penitent, guys. If you haven't seen that, I really encourage you to check out my coverage of that raid wing in which we saw Saul D'Alessio, an isolated prisoner, go mad on his own. And these spirits of his guilt and shame and stuff start torturing him and tormenting him. And we need to purge them from him. He is also, guess what? Going mad and possessed and fighting against us. In that story, we encounter a great nasty looking demon called Deimos. Who is a complete mystery whether he was even real. After the Bastion of the Penitent story came out, ArenaNet on a live stream were asked, is Deimos real or was he just in Saul's head? In that final phase of that raid fight when we actually battled the demon, is that an actual thing on Tyria? Like what's going on here or is it all just a manifestation from Saul? To which they said there was no definitive answer yet and in fact at that time that the community could believe whichever one they wanted. Well here, it's like we've returned to that idea. Now in CM, we do not find Deimos again. Uh, that would be a complete mind blow to me if actual Deimos appeared in the CM. But it is extremely reminiscent. Isolation, causing madness, and possession. And indeed, this woman is possessed by something sinister. Remember Dessa? How I said she's been really into the story so far? She says this is not just dark magic. It's something much more sinister. When the fight ends, the sorrowful spellcaster will actually remark, wow, I've, I've really wanted to be free for a long time. The Dessa connection here, by the way, as far as I can make of it, is maybe hinting at her lost boyfriend. So we, with the Ark Fractals, we learned that Dessa is a mother. Ark was her son, and Ark did this whole thing to try and get her out of the Fractals and so on. But we still don't know about Ark's father. So we've actually got two stories going on with a mother and a daughter with a missing father at once. And I wonder if the devs know that and are leaning into that. That's why I kind of think that this fractal is like poetry because it's like echoes of two very similar stories are happening here. But we have this idea of who was Dessa's boyfriend, what loss did Dessa suffer. As you play through this fractal, pay close attention to how much Dessa is feeling just like the sorrowful spellcaster and trying to help her. There's this beautiful line about Dessa and, and drowning, uh, which is kind of similar to some Silvari dialogue from uh, Heart of Thorns that I was trying to capture for an unrelated video earlier in the week, but it's super hard to find. Uh, the fact that drowning comes up here, again, I don't think is a deep sea dragon connection for those of you immediately thinking of that. She's just talking about like the mental state and the guilt and not being able to get over this great tragedy. Remember with Dessa, we don't know what happened to the boyfriend. So in the CM, it is revealed that this is no longer the sorrowful spellcaster, but the woman on top of the mountain is I. It's this mother that probably was indirectly... It seems like it was probably some kind of magical accident if you ask me, but there's no definitive detail here and you guys can come to your own conclusion. It seems like she accidentally caused the loss of her own daughter, maybe through neglect, probably a magical accident. I think uh, the loss of life through neglect is probably a bit heavy for Guild Wars. You know, I'm not sitting here watching train spotting right now. But, uh, you know, she let her elemental abilities get out of control and she ran to the top of Sunkwa Peak to escape. Another thing happens now that I find very curious. And that is, in the middle of the CM, it gets dark. All the lights go out, and suddenly her abilities are very light-oriented. Like, the, they're no longer elemental skills. They're kind of like beams of light, lasery. Which maybe is a comment on something. Maybe it's just because it looks pretty. Now, the darkness is important, I think. You'll remember in some of those notes earlier, they talked about never letting the light go out. And, well, we have to look at another fractal that came to the game recently. That being the Deepstone fractal. In Deepstone... We find the dwarves dug too deep 
into a dark, shadowy place filled with nightmarish creatures, and the dwarves needed to use their power of the light of Deljamor to keep the darkness away. And in fact, Deepstone was kind of trying to lock this hidden horror away. Uh, and as we play through that fractal, one of our adventuring companions gets possessed. And we fight them off from the possession, and the thing that did the possessing disappears. The question is, is the shadowy demon thing that brought nothing but darkness in Deepstone related to the shadowy demon thing that possesses this character here? There's not a theme of isolation this time, but I do find it interesting that the dwarves have the Deepstone cave and Fractal where we get to see they dig very deep and there's all this shadowy stuff. You've got to remember in Path of Fire there's another big mystery with the dwarves. In the other mine, also guarded by secret riddles and hints and traps and runes, in the Desert Highlands. Except at the bottom of the Desert Highlands ruin where you drop down that massive shaft, you go into the darkness and you don't find dark creatures in there. You find like celestial astral creatures down there. You find like creatures of light. Which is really weird. It's kind of like the yin and the yang of Deepstone and this Desert Highlands place. Then you've got in Cantha itself the story of Kanaxai, a demon deep underground in what was called the Shadow Realm, he referred to it as. Lux and miners would dig too deep, too greedily, and they'd go mad. They'd become outcast. And that was kind of a demon place where the mists seemed to connect to reality to some degree. Again, very deep underground. So I wonder if maybe there's an idea here. That at the Sunqua Peak, this woman starts losing her mind. She tries to isolate herself or she's become possessed somehow. And what she does is she tries to get as far away as possible. Where does she go? Not down, but up. She climbs to the highest point of a nearby mountain to try and escape from this. To try and keep away from people and isolate herself. And she thinks she can control it. The whole way through the fractal, she keeps saying, I've got it. I can figure it out. But she needs our help in the end. I wonder if... There's a connection here between her going to the heights of this mountain and these creatures, these demons possessing you, somehow lingering dirt, deep down in the depths. And then whether this ties at all into the Primordis stuff, who is also in the depths, pff, I, I don't even want to know. I know that this is much more sinister and cool and interesting than anything to do with the Destroyers to me though, so very nice. So when we finally beat the CM mode and we purge the darkness, the thing disappears, and again, unlike with Saul where we see Deimos, we don't see this thing. All the elemental sprites arrive in this beautiful cutscene, including the deer, the mountain spirits, and the big reveal is, of course, as you probably guessed, the spirit is the little girl. She did die at 12. The reason why she can't really speak, she's messing things up and she seems a bit childish, is because it's a little girl and she's just trying to get back to her mother. Her mother who even in the afterlife here or in this fractal or whatever is racked with guilt and sadness and shame over what happened and the little girl just wants to be reunited with her mother. And so that is what we do by completing the fractal. The two get back together. Really the biggest key to all of this, I think, is knowing for sure the little girl did die at a young age, and that's through the gravestone. So, that's most of my thoughts, but do you guys want one big last twist here that is really kind of weird? Let's go back to the gravestones. The gravestones aren't set at the same time as all the notes. No, they're actually a thousand years earlier. Is this that the devs forgot? To type that it's the year 1600 on the Canton calendar and they just put it's the year 600 on the Canton calendar but they are a thousand years prior so depending on whether the devs made a mistake or not they could simply be trying to teach us about how you had these three characters in the past who had a similar story to these three characters here on this mountain at the same time. Echoed again with the similarities from Dessa's story. And, you know, through the ancestor spirits and revering the legends of those who came before us is really important in Cantha. So it all kind of connects and there's some magic or, or beauty in that. That might be what they're doing, or they made a mistake, and I'm scared to go off on a big rant about it in this video. One, because it's already, already been, nearly been 50 minutes, but two, because there might be a patch that changes this. Love to hear what you guys think about that, because that thing with the graves is really what makes this more intriguing than anything else to me. So there you have it, guys. That's the Sunqua Peak. Main things to think about, are there going to be potential Norn in Cantha in the future? Are there going to be potential spears we can wield in the future in Cantha? Are they going to be expanding further on Deimos, Kanaxai, the story of Deepstone? And lastly, 
what about this family? Are they related to Marjorie's family? Are they related to my Trin? Are they related to some of the Guild Wars 1 henchmen? There are Guild Wars 1 henchmen with this family name of Lo, by the way. But there's a weird thing. In Guild Wars 2, they're doing, I think, the real world thing where the, the surname is written first. But in Guild Wars 1, the surname was being written second. So yeah, we do know of some Lows, like Lo Shah in Guild Wars 1. Is Lo Shah related to the characters in this story though? I don't know because the surname, first name thing is getting twisted up. And would it even really matter? I'm not sure. But there you have it. That's the main stuff to think about. Love to hear your responses. Don't be scared to do big walls of text. If you didn't notice, earlier in the week I kicked up a new series called The Floor in which we platform interesting lore theories and do a bit of Q&A. It's a really fun show that I will be dedicating the next episode's main topic on this fractal. So you can leave your big responses down there and you'll get responses in a video. Thanks guys, take it easy. Feel free to check out the links in the description. I've got a Twitter, we've got Discord trying to push people over there. If you want more chat, I've been doing a lot of chat on Discord about this fractal. Until next time guys. See you soon.